I'd like to talk about some work that we're doing on um, software for linear algebra. Uh, you've heard about some of these ideas uh, throughout the course of the two weeks, and uh, this is augmenting that uh, in some sense. So we're going to talk about dense linear algebra, not sparse, um, not, uh, not sparse direct or sparse iterative, but dense uh, methods applied. And uh, we're talking about solving systems of linear equations, uh, least squares problems, and eigenvalue problems. And they occur uh, in many areas. Many, uh, many problems give rise to uh, dense, uh, solving dense matrix problems. You know, sparse matrix problems is where the, the core or the meat of many uh, problems that arise uh, from partial differential equations. But uh, we do have uh, dense uh, problems that do occur. We see them, they're at scale and people want to solve them. And we're developing techniques which help uh, along that way in terms of solving those uh, problems. There's a lot of software that's been developed uh, over the past, I'll say, 30, 40 years. Um, if you're interested in uh, looking at a repository or a collection of software, we've put together uh, a collection of what I'll call the freely available software. So this is software that uh, is available to the community. There's no charge for it. There's certain licensing agreements, of course, that may go along with it. This is the uh, snapshot of the dense matrix problems. Um, and uh, uh, you can go there and find out more details and, and click links and actually download the software. Um, I've had my hands in a number of these packages over the past, uh, what I'll say is um, 40 years, 30 or 40 years. As Paul mentioned, it started with, um, it actually didn't start with Linpack. It started with a package called Icepack, which is a package for dealing with uh, eigenvalue problems. And uh, for various reasons, that had its origins before Linpack. Uh, many of you think of Linpack perhaps as a benchmark, but it started as a collection of mathematical software for solving uh, linear algebra problems. And um, uh, those two packages were updated with something called LA Pack, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, that package was updated uh, with a package called Scala Pack. All of that software, in some sense, is being redone given the architectures that we have today. So the software follows the architectures. That's been the trend. And as new architectures, new ideas come about in terms of high performance computing, the software and the applications will follow of the architecture. We're trying to change that model a bit by doing what's called co-design. This is a list of the top 10 computers today. So this list is compiled every six months. It's uh, ranking computers based on a benchmark, the Linpack benchmark, solving a dense matrix problem. The way this works is you fill up your machine with a dense matrix problem, you solve it using the best method, the best implementation you have for Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, and then you report the time, that time gets converted into a rate of execution, and the rate of execution is used then to rank the computers. So the number one computer is this guy here. It's a machine in China. It's called uh, Tianhu-2. It uh, was built by the National University for Defense Technology. They were the integrators. They also designed the interconnect uh, for that machine. They designed a lot of the software that's used in the machine. It uses uh, Intel, uh, Intel parts. It uses uh, 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 some uh, Ivy Bridge as well as um, as Xeon Phi processors. So it has three million cores. Three million cores. I still have a hard time grappling with that uh, number. Uh, it achieved uh, 30, th roughly 34 petaflops on the benchmark. So that's running the benchmark, 34 petaflops. The peak performance of the machine is higher than that. They achieve 70% of the peak performance. 70% is pretty good for three million cores being used to solve the problem. And uh, the power that was used to run the benchmark under load was about 17.8 megawatts. So that's the power for the memory, for the CPU, and for the interconnect. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the power uh, that, uh, that was used in other parts of the machine. So just those three, just those three components. And then there's something here called efficiency. Uh, that's, that's flops per watt. Right, so you want that number to be as high as possible, roughly at uh, two gigaflops per watt for this machine, two gigaflops per watt. And you can see some of the other machines here. Uh, you know, the things, um, there's a few things to note here. Um, 
uh, what's there to note? Um, the high core counts, a lot of, lot of uh, cores. We have a slightly different way of counting cores than um, some companies have. And I'll, I'll sort of mention that as we, as we go along. Uh, there's something called CUDA cores, right? We're not counting CUDA cores. We're counting the number of aggregate CUDA cores that run a thread of execution. Right? So that's called one core. And that brings down that count of 2,000 cores down to something like to 14 cores on a Kepler, uh, on a Kepler board. Um, uh, so that's, that's what's used in this, process, in this machine here at Oak Ridge National Lab. So a lot, lot of uh, core counts. Um, uh, what we see is uh, power consumption is a big deal on these machines, right? So power today is a big issue on high performance machines. We've been told that uh, probably on every talk uh, for the past uh, two weeks. So we're at, this number here is uh, 17.8. If you add cooling in, so cooling is not, not uh, used in that uh, number, 30% uh, more power would be added to that roughly, 30% more for cooling of the, of the machine. So we're above that 20 megawatt uh, threshold that somebody must have talked about over the past uh, two weeks. And um, you know, we see hybrid architectures, hybrid in the sense of using uh, what I'll loosely call coprocessors. So coprocessors or accelerators or graphics cards. So you could see, you could see the, some of the issues here uh, with these large machines trying to use them. Certainly at scale is going to be a challenge. We have this um, uh, journey that we're on to get to exascale computing. And uh, the journey says, uh, you know, we came from petascale and we're on our way there. Today we're at uh, this point here, 55 petaflops is the peak performance for that machine in China. We want to get to exascale, and we think we can get there sometime between 2020 and 2022. Some of the, some of the variation there comes about because of funding. And um, you know, if we take a scan down here, um, uh, the, the, the exascale machine um, uh, is intended to provide a peak performance of that, of that mark, exascale, and it's intended to be delivered for a price of uh, $200 million and it's intended to use uh, power on the order of 20 megawatts. So that's, um, that's a challenge that the Department of Energy has put down on manufacturers of the machine. So think of that as um, a challenge to, uh, to meet, uh, $200 million, 20 megawatts. Today's machine is at 18 megawatts. So we have to get to 20 megawatts, and we have to come up uh, to, uh, 20 of, by a factor of 20 to do that. So there's great challenges here and going from roughly three giga, gigaflops per watt up to uh, 50 gigaflops per watt. That's where we need to come in terms of the efficiency of, uh, of these machines. The other thing that um, uh, this number here, $200 million um, uh, reflects, is uh, think of it, you're gonna spend roughly half of, half of your money on memory in the machine. Half of the money is gonna go to memory. Um, uh, and uh, you know the semiconductor guys have a pretty good path prediction of where we'll be in this time period. And that says we can buy roughly 32 to 64 <coughs> petabytes of memory for the machine, right? And that's our standard kind of memory. Now, the technology may move so that we can use non-volatile RAM in these machines. And that may help give us more potential memory in these machines. But this would be the prediction uh, with, uh, with, that, uh, with that amount of uh, funding. And that says that uh, you know, we're off by a factor of 50 from where we are today. And a number of other things sort of um, you know, occur in this, uh, in this analysis here. In particular, the amount of concurrency that we're uh, expecting to see is on the order of a billion threads of execution in, in that uh, exascale machine. So you know, a number of things here sort of strikes one as uh, uh, really difficult problems to overcome from an architectural standpoint getting to the right power levels, getting uh, uh, to the effective concurrency, and something that's um, gonna be a great challenge here is to, uh, to get to a point where uh, these machines stay up uh, for, a, for a reasonable amount of time. I don't have information about the meantime between failure on the uh, existing number one machine, but the Sequoia machine, the machine that's at Livermore, I think the number there is they, they see about 1.5 failures per day is what they're seeing on the machine. So the machine would be affected by that, uh, by that uh, rate uh, in terms of applications that are running at scale on the machine uh, having to, uh, to stay up at, at that time. And for a machine which has this number of uh, uh, parts in it, 
uh, we're, we're, we're concerned about the uh, ability for that machine to be up and for our applications uh, to persist uh, given the models that we have for running on these, on these machines. So there's a number of uh, challenges uh, that um, are present as a result of those uh, issues, things about the levels of parallelism, uh, the hybrid uh, nature of the uh, architectures, the bandwidth, and the arithmetic rate, moving data around inside of the machine is going to be certainly an issue. Storage capacity, uh, today we have this uh, notion of uh, weak scalability. So as we grow our problem, we think about running, uh, as we, we think about running out of machine, a uh, bigger size, growing our problem to fit. But if we have a cap in terms of the amount of memory, we can't quite scale the problem to the right level. So we may not see the kind of efficiencies that we can under that weak scalability assumption. Uh, fault, uh, fault issues and other issues relating to the machine itself. From my standpoint of developing software, I see these that are going to be coming up as the major challenges in terms of designing and effectively uh, using software and algorithms on our exascale machines. And they relate to things like uh, synchronization reducing. So we have a machine which has on the order of a billion threads of execution. We are concerned about uh, synchronization points in the machine. We can't have a programming model that does a fork join kind of parallelism. We can't have a programming model that does bulk synchronous processing. That's not going to work when we have billion way parallelism in our architectures. So we have to do something to reduce the synchronization in the algorithms so that we can effectively use that level of parallelism we have in our machines. Communication reducing is also a critical issue and I think uh, Jim Demmel may have talked a bit about uh, the ideas there in terms of uh, designing algorithms that have a provably lower bound in terms of the communication that they exhibit and then implementing those algorithms uh, on an architecture to effectively use them at scale on these machines. And communication aware algorithms certainly uh, plays into this whole idea of reducing the amount of communication effectively using uh, the memory hierarchy of our systems and uh, getting to a point where we can uh, stress the machine at, at the places where it needs to be stressed. Uh, mixed precision methods, you know, floating point arithmetic, we think about 64-bit uh, uh, floating point operations. If we think about using 32-bit floating point operations, we get sort of a, a factor of two in terms of the speed of the floating point operations and we reduce the communication by a factor of two. So both of those things help in terms of getting a more efficient implementation if we can effectively use that 32-bit arithmetic. So the idea here might be to structure an algorithm where you start off a computation using 32-bit arithmetic and then switch to 64-bit arithmetic as the process is converging. As you get nearer the solution, switch to the higher accuracy so you can bring your, your, uh, your overall accuracy of your algorithm up to that point, enjoying the benefits of using that reduced uh, uh, speed as well as the um, uh, floating point uh, uh, time. Auto-tuning is sort of a critical issue today on these machines. Auto-tuning in the sense that the machines are very complicated and we want to design a system which sort of figures out on its own how to take best advantage of the hardware that's in place and do that in a very dynamic way so that if we have a machine which is changing or has a variable number of uh, processors or threads of execution, the algorithm and the software can effectively use that in terms of designing its optimal performance on that machine at this particular moment of time. You can't leave it to the user to make those adjustments in the software. They're too complicated and we really don't want to leave it to the user because the system may be in fact dynamically changing. So we want to build those smarts into the software and have the software auto-tune itself in that way. We want to design algorithms which are fault resistant. That is to say, we want to design algorithms which can tolerate failure, transition past, toler uh, transition past failure, and recover in some sense from those failures. And we're thinking about hard failures where we know that a process dies, but we're also concerned about soft failures where a bit may have been flipped. We want to be able to detect that something's happened and then maybe recover from that bit flip and transition past that in a way which doesn't stop the overall process and terminate the, uh, terminate the overall run. We want to be in a position where we don't have to do a checkpoint occasionally to save our state and then recover from that checkpoint. Checkpoints in the traditional way of writing stuff off the disk are just too expensive on a machine which has this much memory associated with it, moving things off to secondary storage. 
So um, uh, we were looking at ways of building into the algorithms that, um, that way to transition past it. And the final one is about reproducibility. We're concerned about the fact that today's machines are not reproducible. We'd like to think our machines are very deterministic, but you know, if you run your application on a machine today with a certain set of data, and you run your, your application tomorrow with the same number of processors with the same data, you may get the different results. And that comes about because of the way in which operations, it usually comes about because of the way in which the reductions are done inside your machine. So I can't predict the way in which that sum is gonna take place, and because I can't predict it, I may get different round off errors associated with it on day one or day two, and those different round off errors, depending on the algorithm, depending on the algorithm's uh, stability, may lead to large changes in the overall, uh, overall results. Uh, so those are of some concern. And you know, I, I have friends in, in, in uh, doing reactor design and they say they have to ensure that their models give the same results from day one and day two. And I have guys in the climate industry who say the same thing. Our models have to give the same results from day one to day two. And to be honest, when I'm debugging a program, I wanna be sure that I get the same results from day one to day two or I don't know where the problem is. It just makes it much harder to debug problems if I can't ensure that I'm getting the, uh, getting the overall accuracy. So we're thinking about ways to uh, overcome that issue of reproducibility, perhaps slowing down the overall process, uh, but allowing the answers to be reproducible in that sense. Since we're talking about dense computations, I just wanted to throw up this slide about the, the blahs. So the blahs are the basic linear algebra subprograms. And when I run those uh, blahs, they really come in three flavors. They come in vector, matrix vector, or matrix matrix operations. And uh, this is an example running on an Intel processor. This is a single core Sandy Bridge, 2.6 gigahertz. That single core is about 20.8 uh, 20 gigaflops of peak performance, right? So theoretical peak performance is uh, simply just looking at the cycle time, how many floating point operations can be completed per cycle and using that as the, as the peak performance. So at 2.6 gigahertz, uh, this guy here um, is capable of completing eight floating point operations per cycle, that is a single core, can complete eight floating point operations per cycle, and that gives rise to the 20.8. If I think about writing, an, uh, if I think about looking at the performance for level one blahs, so think about a Daxby or a dot product, think about writing that where the data is coming from memory then the peak performance for this machine, because of the memory hierarchy, because of the time it takes to draw that information, and because of the simple nature of the operation, I have, uh, in, a, in a Daxby operation, I have three N operands that have to come to me, two N loads and one, one N store that takes place, and I only have two N floating point operations, and that gives rise to this number of 0.2 gigaflops, that's the theoretical peak performance for a Daxby or a, or a vector kind of operation. So that's two orders of magnitude less than the theoretical peak performance of the machine. So if I think about, if I think about implementing algorithms in terms of this kind of operation, then I'm dead. The performance is, is gonna be running at, at two orders of magnitude less than the theoretical peak performance of the machine. Matrix vector operations is a little bit better, right? I recover an order of magnitude in terms of performance for that operation. I've got a little bit more reuse of data. I have reuse of data in the, so I'm doing a matrix times a vector. I have reuse of data in terms of the X vector and the Y vector, right? But the matrix is sort of um, disposable. I read the matrix in and I, I, I don't get any benefit of that read in another operation. I immediately have to get rid of it and read more of the matrix in. So again, the, 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 uh, the trade-off between loading data and doing floating point operations drives the performance only to about 3.3 uh, gigaflops. So if you design an algorithm which is based in terms of matrix vector operations on that processor, expect that's the peak performance for the machine, right? So matrix vector operations can go no faster than this if you don't get reuse of the data. And then there's a story about matrix multiply. So if you design algorithms around matrix multiply, we can run matrix multiply at much higher levels. N squared data, N cubed operations, that's a surface to volume effect and it allows me to run things and get reuse of data in the memory hierarchy using that cache on the machine to effectively do that matrix uh, multiply in a very effective way. And I can come very close to getting at the theoretical peak performance of that machine. This is at 20.8 and I'm running now at 19.3 uh, gigaflops. 
So I want to design algorithms that are at that level, doing matrix, matrix kinds of operations, right? Then I can hope of getting, uh, getting higher performance. We haven't even talked about doing things in parallel yet. This is on a single core of the machine, trying to extract as much performance as we possibly can from the thing. So matrix, matrix operations is the whole focus then of doing uh, li dense linear algebra on these uh, systems. And if you do anything less than that, then you're gonna be suffering in terms of that uh, issue related to uh, data movement. Okay, the other thing we have to contend with is hybrid systems. So here's a cartoon of a hybrid machine. So we've got an Intel commodity processor over here, a Sandy Bridge processor connected to a, a, a Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor. And um, you know, we take a look at this guy here. This is a machine which has uh, eight, eight cores, 2.6 gigahertz and eight, it does that eight uh, operations per cycle per core. So that gives rise to on the Sandy Bridge side about 166 gigaflops. On the uh, coprocessor side, it, the, it has 244 of what they call cores, and um, we translate that into about 60 what I would call cores, or floating point units that can actually do independent threads of execution on this, on this machine here. So there's about 60 of them that are functional. One point, uh, roughly gigahertz is the cycle time, and we're looking at 60 times the cycle time, uh, times uh, eight times two floating point operations, uh, that gives rise to this number of 1.3 teraflops is the theoretical peak performance for that uh, Xeon Phi processor. And the way this works, the way th that we use this, the way that many people use it to extract performance, this guy's in charge. He's the guy controlling the show. He has some memory here. And what's gonna happen is he's going to uh, put some uh, information in its memory and move it over to the, uh, the coprocessor side. The coprocessor side then is gonna execute some instructions that this guy says to execute. Those instructions get executed over on the coprocessor and then eventually data would be brought back over to the, to the host side of the machine. We're using it as a, as a client server kind of application. That's the way we use NVIDIA. That's the way we use the AMD parts. That's the way we use the Intel uh, Xeon Phi parts. There may be a different story down the line, but this turns out to be the most effective way of using this particular device uh, today. So the host moving data over to the, uh, to the coprocessor, the coprocessor doing the operations and then moving stuff back over here. That can happen, uh, the host can be running asynchronously. So the host guy here can be doing other operations while the, while the operations take place in the coprocessor and then drag the information back and then continue the operations. So that's the story that we have. The problem is that information has to go from the host memory over to the memory of these uh, coprocessors here, and that's done through the interconnect, the PCI Express. And that PCI Express has a certain bandwidth associated with it. And that bandwidth um, looks like one gigaword per second. So that's 64-bit giga uh, uh, words that we're, we're talking about here. That's the rate that we can move information across there and uh, you know, this has got a teraflop worth of computing power. So this is gonna be a strangle point. We got three orders of magnitude here that were different between moving data. So think about moving data over to the coprocessor, doing an operation there and moving data back. You better get a lot of reuse of data once you've moved it over here. Uh, otherwise, you'll be spending all of your time at this point here of your, of your machine and you'll not see anything close to that theoretical uh, peak performance. So you have to effectively use the memory hierarchy associated with this machine that is structure things so you get reuse of data here uh, effectively using this part of the architecture before you're moving things back and forth. So think about those matrix uh, operations that we saw in the previous slide. Think about those vector operations. If you think about using the coprocessor here to do a vector operation like a DAXB or a dot product, you move data over, you do that very rapidly here, and then you spend all of your time moving moving the results back, moving data back and forth. So you can't do that. Matrix vector operations will suffer from the same kind of penalty of, of that uh, transition between the two parts of the machine. And the way to effectively use it is to do those matrix matrix blocked operations on the coprocessor where again you get that surface to volume effect moving over quote uh, n squared pieces of data and getting n cubed operations in return for it, hopefully uh, capturing that high performance uh, in your algorithm. So that's, uh, that's how that sort of fits into the overall uh, story. 
Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that we're doing on, in dense linear algebra. It has its origins in uh, a number of packages, um, uh, IcePack, WinPack, the Blas, LAPack, ScalaPack. That's the origins of what I'll talk about. And uh, today's packages that we're developing are called Plasma, and that works on many core uh, processors, uh, and uh, DPlasma, which works in a situation where we have a distributed set of processors where uh, message passing uh, takes place. And there's a um, auxiliary package that we have called Magma, which is designed to work with uh, coprocessors or accelerators. So think of those same operations being implemented in a way that can effectively use uh, those uh, coprocessors from Intel, NVIDIA, and uh, AMD. So the, the, software, um, uh, the software that we have in place, the software stack, uh, is based um, uh, on many of the parts that came before. They're based on the blahs. We do effectively use LAPAC and ScalaPAC uh, in terms of getting, uh, getting the performance out of them. And we've designed a runtime system which allows us to effectively use the levels of parallelism that we see on our machines. And that runtime system is responsible for basically scheduling work on the underlying uh, hardware. For, the, for, a, for a machine which is based uh, in terms of a shared memory architecture, that runtime system is called Quark. And for a machine that's based on a distributed memory architecture, that runtime system is called DPlasma. Think of those guys as handing out work to the available processors that we have and managing the dependencies between the work so that other things can be done in parallel. And I'll, I'll have more to say about that uh, as we go on. This is one example of uh, this kind of architecture and this kind of software that's in place. Other people have similar models. They all have a similar kind of approach to them in terms of uh, doing work on small blocks of matrices and trying to extract performance from doing matrix, matrix kinds of operations. Right? So um, what I'm talking about here is an example of that. This is not the only example of that. Uh, but this is the example that we have, and this is the example that we're intending uh, to basically do a replacement of uh, this, these two libraries here uh, with uh, modern, I'll call state-of-the-art uh, software techniques. Okay, just to sort of uh, get a level field here, if we think about doing an LU factorization, and we think about um, uh, solving the system of equations doing Gaussian elimination, uh, a cartoon version of that implementation says that we're at some step of the process here and I want to introduce zeros in that column of the matrix. So I think about uh, the way I learned how to do Gaussian elimination in high school. I take a multiple of one row and add it to another row to make, introduce a zero in that row. And I can structure that to basically introduce zeros down the whole column here. Uh, and then I think about having to apply that set of transformations that I just performed that zeroing operation is a, is, can be thought of as a, as a transformation that I apply to the matrix. And I think of that as applying it to the rest of the matrix. Uh, it's basically a rank one uh, change to that uh, blue part of the matrix here, uh, updating that matrix. And from that, we move on to the next step of the process. There's some pivoting that has to happen uh, in order to ensure stability of the algorithm. And um, that's sort of the basic way uh, we think about uh, doing business. Uh, there's a few problems with that algorithm. The first problem is it's designed around a level one Blas operation. So that's going to perform at some very substandard rate on today's machine. The, upper, the other problem is that we have this, um, this rank one update, which is really a Blas one operation, and um, we have this bulk synchronous processing that we do in terms of, uh, of, of trying to extract parallelism from that. Right, so we do have a place where we do parallelism, and that's updating this, updating this block of the matrix. I can think of employing a lot of processors to do that, and that might, uh, that might give uh, a certain level of parallelism. But I went through a sequential process first before I got to that parallel part, and that's going to that's gonna inhibit the overall parallelism. Another way of thinking of this is trying to get around that uh, use of level one blahs. The level one blahs was that, uh, was that reduction of that one column. Instead of reducing one column, we think about um, doing something off on the side which reduces a bunch of columns of the matrix, introducing zeros uh, in a bunch of columns, and then applying that whole set of transformations to the rest of the matrix. 
And when you, when you structure an algorithm like that, you end up with having to do some level one and level two operations in terms of introducing zeros in that, in that panel of the matrix. You end up doing a triangular solve across uh, many uh, columns of the matrix. And then you do a matrix multiply, which basically updates this green part of the matrix. And it's through that matrix multiply that we can extract a fair amount of performance uh, from the overall method before we go on to the next step of the process. So this is a way to sort of give us a boost in terms of performance in doing a major operation, taking us from level one blahs to getting us to level three blahs operations. But we still have this issue of having to do something in a very sequential way initially uh, before, we move on to the, before we move on to the part where we can do something in parallel. So we still have that bulk synchronous fork join kind of processing going on in our algorithm. And um, that's where we are up to, the, up to what I'll say is the 90s in terms of parallel processing. So things started in the 70s with LINPAC where LINPAC was designed for vector uh, machines doing vector kind of operations. That was changed in the 80s when we had architectures which were much more cache friendly or cache aware where we can take advantage of the memory hierarchy by doing those block operations. And in the 90s, when we had distributed memory, we, we worked out a scheme where we can, do the, that we can do that effectively by decomposing that matrix, spreading it out across the processors, and then doing the operations in a very parallel way across those processors. And it's important to uh, understand how the matrix gets decomposed in terms of the uh, uh, different processors. Uh, that we have available to work on it. In this particular case, we have six processors that are arranged in a two by three logical grid, and the matrix is decomposed, so, so processors uh, get components of the matrix or tiles of the matrix, which are scattered throughout the matrix. So on, on a given processor, we may have uh, 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 components from various parts of that matrix, and that's to ensure we get good a load balancing across that whole, that, whole, uh, that whole machine. So that's the organization that's in place with a package called Scalapack for distributed memory machines. And uh, that uh, idea uh, certainly had worked uh, well uh, 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 until just recently. So again, we're looking at blocked operations. If I think about doing a LU factorization or a QR factorization, the cartoon version of that says we can represent that factorization as a sequence of, of operations that occur on panels of the matrix. So we do, a, we do an operation which introduces some zeros in the matrix. We have to apply a set of transformations uh, to components of the matrix. And then we do a matrix multiply to finish off that uh, application before we move on to the next, the next step. So the components are easily identified and uh, can, be, uh, can be used to give us a high level of performance while we're doing those components, uh, uh, but uh, we have this uh, fork join kind of parallelism that takes place uh, across, across that uh, algorithm, uh, which, uh, which leads to a very inefficient kind of operation. So again, the fork join parallelism is we're doing something sequential, we fork off a number of things, then we have to join together again. And when I have hundreds of thousands of processors, I can't do that fork join kind of parallelism. I can't do that sequentialization that takes place there. It just slows everything down to the point of being uh, basically uh, very inefficient in the overall execution. So we're trying to structure things a little bit differently. Um, if I think about a, a situation where I do that uh, operation and I look at sort of a, a timing graph of this on a, um, uh, on a machine which has on the order of 16 cores, I end up doing the sequential part uh, and then I do something in parallel when I can exploit all the processors and I again do a sequential part of the algorithm. So that's the fork join kind of uh, parallelism uh, that's there where each of the steps of the algorithm uh, in, engages in a sequentialized part and then a, paralyzed, a parallel part of the overall algorithm and that's repeated over and over again until we uh, complete the factorization. What we would like to do is to basically do more than one step simultaneously. So what we want to do as soon as possible to start the next step of the process. As soon as, we've, as soon as we've completed or updated part of the matrix, we want to engage in the next step. Think of it as sort of looking ahead uh, in the process 
so that you can engage before you actually start the overall process and do that repeatedly, sort of recursively apply that idea uh, to get us as far ahead as possible. And if you do that, you end up with the situation and you make the work uh, into these uh, what we call tiles, we end up with a situation where we uh, basically do a, a, a panel of the matrix and as soon as we can, we think about applying those operations to the, to the rest of the matrix before we complete uh, the rest of the operations on that uh, particular panel. And that allows for this uh, delayed kind of execution. It's almost an out of order uh, execution which allows for much more uh, asynchrony and is a very much data flow directed implementation of this algorithm. So we end up with a directed acyclic graph which looks something like this where each node of this is this graph is one of these operations that we're doing there. And uh, instead of waiting until we complete the whole sequence, as soon as possible we start the next one uh, down the line. And as soon as possible we start the next one and can carry that out so we basically um, uh, expose a lot of parallelism in the algorithm and if we could take advantage of that parallelism in terms of scheduling those events uh, based on the data flow characteristics, based on the dependencies associated with the nodes of the graph, we'll be in a better position to overall uh, complete the execution path. So this critical path of the algorithm is the one that has to be done as soon as possible to free up as much parallelism as possible throughout the course of the uh, execution. So that leads to this uh, very much data flow driven kind of execution where we think about these tiles and we think about these tiles being applied and as soon as possible being able to schedule those tiles in a way that can effectively drive that, uh, that uh, data flow uh, like uh, execution getting this out of order, uh, getting this very asynchronous uh, flow to the algorithm. It's important when doing that, that we have the data arranged in a way that we can effectively make, take access or make access to the data elements. We think about our original two-dimensional array as perhaps being laid out in a very column-oriented fashion following a Fortran-centric view of the matrix. Uh, that would not lead to a very efficient execution when we want to pick up a tile of the matrix and apply it. So instead of organizing the matrix in this column fashion, we organize it in a very tile fashion where, those, where the elements of the tile are stored contiguously in memory so that when we access this tile, we're actually in a position to access that whole tile very efficiently by uh, just incremental ex uh, access rather than by jumping around in the matrix, uh, which we would have to do if it was laid out in a very column-oriented fashion. And that allows us to, again, get, uh, get very efficient uh, execution. So this uh, plasma algorithm, uh, the plasma algorithms that we're working on are very tile-oriented. Uh, uh, we try to effectively exploit uh, that data-driven kind of parallelism. And uh, we have a runtime scheduler which takes those tiles along with the data dependencies associated with it and executes them on the machine. So in some sense, think of the algorithm as doing the following things. It generates all the work, but doesn't do the work. It generates all the tasks that have to be done, and then the scheduler takes those tasks and executing, executes them respecting the data flow characteristics. Data flow characteristics come about because we identify, when we say we're going to do a piece of operation, a piece of, when we think about, when we say we're going to do an operation, we identify the inputs and outputs associated with that operation. So think about uh, taking a matrix multiply and, and dividing it up into a number of smaller matrix multiplies where each one we've identified what the inputs and outputs are associated with that matrix multiply. That together with the scheduler and its knowledge of the whole structure of the computation will allow it to schedule those events uh, in, the, uh, in the optimal way along with uh, some perhaps hints uh, that the user might give in terms of what the critical path is. So the algorithm that we have at a high level looks something like this. We've, we've taken it and we've uh, broken it down into these things we call tiles. The tile size is associated with some understanding of what's going to be optimal on a given machine uh, for a particular uh, hardware characteristic such as the cache. So it's targeted so that we can fit things into cache. Think of uh, operations, uh, think of tiles as being size 64 or 128. That would have to be tuned 
depending on the specifics of your, of your machine. And then an operation says something like this. We want to do an operation on a tile of the matrix, and uh, the inputs are here and the outputs are listed here, and we want to do a, something like a triangular solve with this as the inputs and the outputs here. So the user has to go through a process of uh, thinking of identifying what's, what's the operation at a high level, at a, at a tile level, and then identifying what the inputs and outputs are associated with that. And then from that kind of uh, pseudocode, uh, uh, actual code would be written that plugs into a scheduling mechanism. Uh, that scheduling mechanism is a call to uh, the quark system. The quark, again, is this runtime, runtime scheduling system that we have. And that quark system then has uh, implemented uh, the various operations that we have together with the uh, inputs and outputs which have been specified. Uh, it, it then takes that information and uh, tries to schedule it uh, in a way which is optimal for a given, uh, given system. So that's what we end up with is instead of taking this uh, very fork join kind of uh, parallelism using this uh, dynamic uh, nature, this DAG uh, structured computation, we end up with a scheduler which can uh, basically reduce the overall time, getting rid of much of that uh, idleness associated with the fork join processing and uh, compressing the overall time uh, to solution for this particular, uh, for this particular problem. Now these DAGs can be pretty large. So this is a, this is a, a DAG which has been generated uh, for uh, some problem size. If we had an ideal world, the scheduler would be able to look at the DAG, figure out the critical path, and then schedule the tasks associated with that particular DAG in an optimal fashion. But because the DAGs are so large, uh, we, can't, we can't literally just store the DAGs and then think about executing those DAGs in a, in a sequential, in, in a shared memory kind of uh, machine. So we, we actually have a scheduler which looks at a window of that DAG. It basically generates a set of tasks and then starts executing that, uh, that set of tasks on the underlying hardware. And as those uh, tasks are executed, uh, the scheduler looks at another set of tasks. It, it, it executes more of those tasks and continues that process until we until we complete uh, the overall uh, directed acyclic uh, graph for that uh, for that matrix. So this is an example doing a QR factorization of a matrix. This is a what I'll call a classical uh, QR factorization, not a communication reducing uh, factorization that you heard about from uh, Jim Demel. Uh, it has various components associated with it. Uh, we, have to, we have to take into account uh, uh, doing a factorization of a, of a block and then applying that to this uh, blue part of the matrix and then doing an update which basically uh, uh, applies a set of transformations uh, to the green uh, part of the matrix. And each of those routines has a, has, a, has a task associated with it and has tiles that it has as inputs and uh, based on that information uh, we can effectively uh, generate that directed acyclic graph and then schedule that to be executed on a given, on a given uh, hardware platform. Uh, the, the format th that uh, we think about in that context identifies what the tasks are, identifies the inputs and outputs associated uh, with a particular set of tasks, and then runs them on a, on a machine. So the user is responsible for uh, making this call uh, the, the task that has to be done and then also identifying what the inputs and outputs are associated with that particular, um, that particular operation. And then given that information, uh, the runtime system can effectively do that execution on the, uh, on the given architecture. So this has been done for a number of uh, algorithms uh, in, in the collection. Uh, the algorithms uh, in this case is a Cholesky factorization. There's an equivalent uh, Cholesky factorization uh, that's, uh, that, that's in LAPAC, and if a user was using that routine, they could easily modify that calling sequence uh, to use uh, this routine. Uh, 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 the user uh, could call it with the uh, same data structure. Remember I said the data has to be organized in terms of tiles. The user can call the uh, plasma routine using that same data structure, and the first thing that the routine will do is to reorganize it to move the data into tiles and then execute that on the underlying hardware. Or if the user already had pre, uh, predefined a matrix in terms of tiles, uh, the, the underlying routine 
uh, would, would work without having to do that initial step of reorganizing, uh, reorganizing the, uh, uh, the algorithm. Uh, there's an LU factorization uh, that's in there. It works very similar to the uh, LAPAC factorization. Uh, provides, uh, provides that kind of solution with the same uh, kind of guarantees in terms of accuracy. There's a QR factorization in the, in the package, again, which is very similar in terms of the numerics uh, for the LAPAC routine, provides a very similar kind of uh, implementation and uh, provides a much better uh, performance. There's a routine which looks at the symmetric uh, eigenvalue problem and does it in a way which effectively uses uh, blocked operations uh, for the reduction to, uh, to its uh, condensed form. In this case, it's a tridiagonal matrix and then executes the standard uh, uh, operation for computing the eigenvalues of that uh, tridiagonal matrix. There's a routine that, that does a very similar thing for computing the singular values uh, of a matrix, again, uh, doing it in a very tile-based uh, fashion, scheduling those operations across the underlying hardware in a way that can effectively take advantage of that, uh, of that hardware. Now, in some cases, we want to put together a number of uh, library routines to accomplish a given task. If we think about computing a variance-covariance matrix uh, of some problem, we have to put together three particular routines from the package. The first routine is one that does a matrix factorization. We have a symmetric positive definite matrix, and we really want to compute uh, the inverse of that matrix. So the first thing we do is we factor the matrix into simpler components. Uh, we take those simpler components and we compute uh, uh, the inverse of, of that, triangular, of that uh, upper triangular matrix, and then we take that triangle uh, and multiply it by itself to compute the inverse of the, uh, of the original matrix. And if we think about those, those routines and we think about running them in this context of a, of a system which allows one to effectively use all of the processors that are available, getting a high level of performance out of it, we end up with a situation like this with 64 cores on, a, on this particular shared memory machine. Uh, the factorization would look like this and then we would move to the uh, computing the inverse and that inverse has a characterization which looks something like this and then we would move to the part of the algorithm which uh, executes the part where it multiplies uh, the inverse uh, times itself to compute the inverse of the original problem. So three very distinct uh, processes. Each one has a, a directed acyclic graph associated with it. It's been uh, defined in terms of tiles and uh, that runs um, at a reasonable rate of execution. But obviously between these calls here, we have, this, uh, we have this part where the algorithm has to shut down, so we don't get as much, we don't get as much parallelism associated with it. And uh, similar here, we have a startup when we're computing the inverse of this triangular uh, matrix or multiplying it by itself, where we uh, end up with uh, not a lot to do in parallel. So what we would like to do is to be able to, in some sense, push these three DAGs together and do as much as possible simultaneously, overlapping operations where it's possible. Remember, this has been scheduled, so we have these tasks available to the runtime system, and if it can execute some of these yellow tasks before we have completed all the blue tasks, it has the, it has the uh, opportunity to, in fact, engage in that. So that's exactly what the runtime system does in this case. It takes those three DAGs and allows one to basically uh, compose those three DAGs into a unified uh, uh, directed acyclic graph, and that unified directed acyclic graph allows for opportunities uh, for exploiting parallelism because of the dependencies that it has uh, before it would, if those things were done as independent uh, tasks. And we end up with a much more compressed um, uh, time uh, for the overall algorithm because of that, um, because of that uh, merging of those uh, parallel tasks into a single directed acyclic graph that's exposed to the runtime system. So that's what, that's what can be accomplished uh, with, the, uh, with the runtime system and with algorithms that have been expressed in terms of this uh, uh, tiled nature and uh, where the user is explicitly put in information about the inputs and outputs of those tile operations. Um, we have uh, implemented in, in the plasma collection uh, an incremental QR, this is uh, very similar to what Jim, uh, Jim Demmel talked about in terms of 
um, the um, uh, communication avoiding uh, uh, QR factorization, where we think about uh, doing this algorithm in a way that um, is done on independent parts of the matrix. When we think about collapsing those independent parts then in a, in a tree fashion uh, to allow a very efficient and uh, reduced uh, communication associated with it until we end up with a, um, uh, the QR factorization of the, of the whole matrix. And that gives rise to a much better uh, execution. This is a particular um, uh, execution uh, done on a very tall, skinny matrix. The, the, uh, the algorithm is really designed for this particular kind of matrix. So we have uh, 51,000 uh, rows in the matrix and 3,000 uh, 3, columns associated with the matrix, so a very tall, skinny matrix. This is running on a shared memory machine with 16 uh, cores in it. And we're looking at the performance using different packages. So the package that, um, that we might think of using is LAPAC. That was the package that was designed uh, in the 80s, looking at uh, trying to effectively use the uh, memory hierarchy of the machine. That's a very straightforward, conventional implementation. And we would get a performance that looks something like this. MKL is the Intel math kernel library implementation of the LAPAC algorithm. So they basically follow the LAPAC steps in terms of doing their, their implementation, but doing it much more efficient, much more efficiently implemented than we do on a, on a version which is very generic that can run across uh, any architecture. And then we looked at taking the Scalapack algorithm. So Scalapack implements the same basic algorithm that's in LAPAC. It does that same householder column factorization, but in Scalapack we basically are directing where the uh, data is. We're doing message passing even on a shared memory machine. But data has been organized or laid out in a very, very simple way so it's easy to grasp that information. And we end up with getting much higher performance on a shared memory machine using a distributed memory implementation where MPI is not really passing messages around, it's just passing the pointers around where the data is located. And then the plasma implementation. The plasma Im implementation is one that looks at tiles. It's the same characteristic algorithm associated with it, basically taking a block, uh, block householder implementation, but we can do it much more efficiently because we're scheduling tasks and getting overlap of operations, breaking that fork join kind of parallelism associated with it, and, um, and then doing a communication avoiding uh, situation on that particular matrix, very tall and skinny, uh, using that tree, a way of uh, doing the uh, householder uh, effectively, allows one to minimize communication and allows one to run uh, much, much faster than we can do with plasma and clearly much faster than we can with the more conventional uh, implementations of those matrices. So that's, uh, that's a good uh, indicator of the uh, effectiveness of this algorithm. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that we have a very special matrix in some sense, tall and skinny, but that's where that algorithm uh, really works well. If the matrix was not tall and skinny, we would see these two things much closer, much closer together. Uh, so the performance would not uh, see that great uh, gap between, uh, between the two guys. We're looking at uh, what I'll call experimenting some, with some algorithms where uh, we're trying really to uh, break, um, uh, break as much of that uh, synchronization as possible. So in, in a standard LU factorization, we have to do a pivoting, a pivoting step, uh, which allows for stability of the algorithm. Uh, but, so the question is, wouldn't it be nice if we can avoid that pivoting step so we didn't have that, uh, that, that uh, situation of sequentializing that part of the computation? So this is a scheme uh, which tries to avoid the uh, pivoting. And it basically takes the matrix and applies to it a randomization technique. The randomization technique is intended to smear out the matrix so that the chance of you having to pivot is basically zero. Right? So it basically is applying a transformation which says you don't have to pivot in this, in this matrix. Think of it as a preconditioning step. You want to precondition the matrix by a transformation which reduces the likelihood of having to pivot and then go ahead and do the thing without pivoting. Right? So we're, in, we're into a space here where the algorithm is not guaranteed to give us the answer. Right? So that's a, that's a concern that one has to have. 
So we have to have a way to check to see that we get the right answer. That would be a useful thing to have. But we have an opportunity then to run at very high speeds. The randomization has to be done for very low cost. So what we do is we basically take what's called a butterfly transformation. Butterfly transformation is just simply, take, think about our full um, n by n matrix. Think about splitting it into uh, n over 2 uh, matrices where each of the matrices now are diagonal matrices and apply that into the matrix uh, as a pre and post multiplication on the matrix itself. So we have a matrix, a butterfly matrix on each side of our original matrix. That, uh, think of that as sort of smearing out the matrix now with that randomized transformation, factoring the matrix without doing the pivoting step, and then undoing those transformations to get back at the, uh, to get back at the solution. So that's a scheme that um, produces very high rates of execution and the accuracy in practice is uh, similar to the accuracy that we see out of Gauss elimination with partial pivoting when we engage in a step of iterative refinement. But there, there are examples where the matrix fails, right? So that, that's something to be concerned about and we need to have a check to verify that in fact we're not in that situation. And the check to verify that is with iterative refinement. And I'll, I'll mention iterative refinement as a process uh, in a few slides, but that's a, that's a step where if it doesn't refine the solution, we're in a position where we're, we're into this, uh, we're into this uh, problem area uh, where in fact uh, we're not gonna get the right answer given, uh, given not pivoting for the matrix. Uh, so we can do the algorithm at very high speeds, check to see that we've uh, gotten the right answer, and if we don't get the right answer, back off and do, the, do it with the uh, conventional, uh, conventional algorithm. So taking a look at a profile of execution uh, for this particular algorithm, when run on a, a number of cores here, eight cores of this, uh, or 12 cores of this AMD system, this is the overall execution time that's given here. This is the amount of time we spend in the randomization step. So very small amount of time in the randomization but the algorithm runs at full speed without having to have any delays associated with uh, computing uh, those pivots or doing the interchanges associated uh, with that, uh, reducing communication, uh, overall running at much higher rates of execution, uh, giving that randomization. This technique can be applied to a number of algorithms where we engage in that uh, pivoting step to ensure stability. That is, uh, we, we, we use the algorithm without the by, by, by doing this uh, randomization, we run the algorithm without the pivoting, and then we check to see, in fact, that we get the right answer. And if we did get the right answer, we benefit from it. If we don't get the right answer, we have to back off and uh, do it using the conventional, uh, conventional factorization. Um, so the overall scheme here is to, um, uh, is to ensure that the software that we have will, in fact, run on hybrid systems. Hybrid systems are are systems that are gonna be in place and uh, be, be around for, um, we feel, a while. We have to design the software so we can effectively use those architectures. And that's really the purpose of this package we have called Magma, which is designed specifically for uh, using coprocessors uh, where we're gonna offload a, a big chunk of the work to those coprocessors and effectively use it. Again, we have this uh, notion of a directed acyclic graph, but we want to offload a large uh, chunk of that work to the coprocessor so that it can effectively uh, run, that, uh, run that on a given on a given machine. At a high level, what we think about doing is uh, using the coprocessor here to, to do that uh, application of, of the uh, set of transformations which come about by reducing a panel. Uh, think about using the coprocessor to help uh, perform those operations on the trailing part uh, of, the, um, of the matrix. And if we have multiple coprocessors, uh, we just think of applying that over and over again to various parts of the matrix, uh, using the host processor as, as doing the initial reduction of a given panel of the matrix, and then uh, having the coprocessor do the application of that. This is a performance graph uh, looking at um, uh, doing an LU factorization here. This is a very conventional LU factorization. This is the performance that we see when we use one of the uh, Intel Xeon 5 processors. So we have a box which has um, uh, a host processor which looks like uh, two 
Sandy Bridge uh, sockets, each of those sockets uh, have a certain performance associated with it. We're going to run uh, on that host and then we're going to attach to that uh, one of these uh, Xeon 5 processors. So this is the performance uh, that we see when we do that. If we attach two of those uh, Xeon 5s to that uh, same host uh, processor, uh, we see performance which uh, is, gets a boost from it. You know, notice at this point here we're not seeing enhancements in performance. So we need some mechanism in the software to make decisions when it makes sense to do one mic processor or both mic processors. Where's that, where's that trade-off point and effectively uh, drive the computation? And then using uh, three Xeon Phi processors, a similar kind of uh, story uh, associated with, uh, with it. And then uh, using four Xeon processors. So there's a box which has uh, uh, Sandy Bridge plus uh, four uh, of the Xeon Phi processors getting to uh, this kind of performance levels uh, when using that. And as far as the user is concerned, uh, the user really um, uh, posed just the problem to the box and the software would be in a position to figure out uh, based on the size uh, of the matrix as input which of those uh, parts of the machine would be effectively used. Uh, this is uh, looking at something else which is too complicated to describe. But this is doing a very detailed analysis of uh, looking at uh, four sockets uh, with four GPUs associated with it, looking at the effective use of those cores as well as the GPUs, as well as the uh, DMA links uh, between them. We want to keep everything busy uh, uh, as much as possible, reducing that white space uh, between them as much as possible. Uh, in order to uh, reduce the overall time. So the algorithms we have do a pretty good job of, uh, of doing that, reducing again that white space, uh, shrinking the uh, sequentialization of the, of the overall thing and effectively using uh, the, the, the GPU parts of the machine as well as uh, the, the links uh, that, that are associated with that. I mentioned this issue about mixed precision. So uh, mixed precision uh, has some usefulness in terms of uh, the operations are performed twice as fast in 32-bit arithmetic than in 64-bit arithmetic, and we get a benefit of moving less data around. So we want to capitalize on both of that, uh, on both of those things. And we think about using the lower precision to uh, perhaps get a, uh, an approximation to our result, and then using the higher precision to effectively um, uh, effectively compute the solution. And at some level, I want to think of it almost like um, I, I want to I be in a position to compute um, you know, the major part of the solution and then go back and compute the correction to the solution that gives me higher precision. So I'm going to compute with 32-bit arithmetic to get the uh, basic answer and then I come back with 64-bit arithmetic and give me that extra boost in terms of the, uh, the solution. And if I think about um, uh, solving, uh, taking a Newton step here, and I think about the next, uh, the next guess based on the previous guess plus some correction uh, to that, um, I, you know, I, in some sense what I want to do when I think about uh, I've, got a, I've got an approximation and I want to add something to the approximation, what I really want to do is not compute the next, the next guess. I want to compute the difference between those two guesses and use that as the correction. So I think about using that to allow me to basically put together those two parts of the solution to give me uh, something which was more accurate uh, overall. So that's sort of a, a, a rough way of uh, thinking about the process. So we want to exploit 32-bit arithmetic. We want to do most of the work in 32-bit arithmetic and then come back with a correction at this higher precision, uh, which allows me to uh, basically exploit uh, that 32-bit uh, result and do uh, as little work as possible with the higher, uh, with the higher precision. So in linear algebra, we have this thing called iterative refinement. And it was basically used to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to exploit um, uh, adding, uh, getting additional precision. So if I think about uh, solving a system of linear equations, I think about doing an LU factorization of that matrix. And that has a certain amount of work associated with it. I think about computing a solution to that system of linear equations. Uh, that also has a certain amount of work associated with it. So the factorization has a lot, has order n cubed operations. Computing the solution based on that factorization is order n squared operations. 
If I think about the iterative refinement step says, go back and compute a residual to the problem. That is, get the original data. So I need a copy of the original data. So if there's a penalty associated with this, with this process, it's that I need a, a copy of the original matrix. And I take, uh, I take a copy of that and compute the factorization. So I need two times the storage. So think of that as the penalty associated with it. I've taken my original matrix and I over, I've overwritten it with LNU, the LNU factors. I need another copy to compute this residual. I can't use LNU to compute the residual. That, that won't produce the right kind of result. So I compute a residual associated with the problem. And then the iterative refinement step says, what I'm gonna do is to use that residual as the right-hand side and compute a solution. And that solution mathematically turns out to be a correction uh, to the original problem. And then I think about computing a residual to see if it's gotten better. And then I repeat that process until I get tired, right, or until it converges. And um, uh, if I look at the overall work associated with it, uh, it's n cubed operations to start with. And each of the other components is either n squared or order n uh, operations. So this has been well studied and well thought out and provides error bounds uh, when we think about using single precision uh, uh, at, uh, at certain parts and double precision at, at other parts. And we want to exploit that in terms of computing a solution which does this operation in single precision and then selectively uses double precision uh, to carry out various parts of that computation. So the way in which the algorithm is structured, we use single precision to compute that factorization and to compute the initial guess we use double precision in computing that residual. We have a single precision answer. We have a single precision right-hand side. We have our matrix here, but we do this computation now uh, in full precision, computing a residual in full precision. And then we use single precision again with that residual to compute the correction. That's this thing which is gonna be, which is gonna be added to the solution to enhance the value of that, of that solution. And that step of, has to be done in, in extended precision and then we go back and compute our residual again in extended precision. So uh, we're, we're, mathematically you can show that when this process converges, if the process converges, it's gonna converge to the same answer that you would have gotten had you done the whole thing in 64-bit arithmetic. So if you had done the whole thing in 64-bit arithmetic and go through this process where we selectively use 60, 64 and 32-bit arithmetic, we're gonna end up with the same uh, answer if we converge. So the rules on convergence say something about the condition number of the matrix. If the matrix is reasonably conditioned, you're gonna to converge to the solution. If your matrix has uh, a condition number of 10 to the eighth, or you're getting zero digits out in single precision, you're not gonna converge, right? And the convergence rate is gonna be determined how many digits you get, how, how long it takes to, to converge here. If the matrix is well conditioned, it's gonna take two iterations and you're done. Every, every digit that you, uh, every order of magnitude in terms of the condition number reduces the, uh, reduces the time to, to converge. So the, um, so the storage requirement says I need a copy of the matrix in single precision, I need a copy of the matrix in double precision to compute the residual. So I have one and a half times the storage requirements for the algorithm. And I'm gonna be doing n cubed operations in single precision and I'm gonna be using double precision selectively just to do order n squared operations. So the algorithm should be, dr should be driven to a order n squared, uh, sorry, to a single precision kind of um, uh, performance and achieve a double precision kind of solution. So if we take a look at an at implementation uh, when done in single precision and double precision, so this is LU decomposition, forget about mixed precision for the moment, just do a single precision and a double precision run. Uh, this is the performance we get. This was done on a system which had um, uh, a Kepler GPU associated with, uh, with the overall box using our Magma, our Magma software. So that's that factor of two in performance there between single and double precision, at least when the matrix is big enough. And that's coming about because, the, uh, because of data movement issues as well as issues relating to uh, the performance at single and double precision. And when we use iterative refinement, that is we're gonna do the factorization in single precision and go through that step to refine the solution, we're getting performance which is tracking much closer to what we would end up with in, 
in the single precision. So that's a story which basically says there's room here for these kinds of algorithms uh, within the context of doing this. So you can do this for um, uh, many of the factorizations. Yes? Right, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have confused it with the GPU. It's about the same. In fact, it's a little bit better. The performance is a little bit better. The same issues are involved. There's a factor of two in terms of the floating point arithmetic and the data movements are the same kind of thing. We're getting that same uh, reduction in overall, overall effect. So the original work that was done didn't have GPUs at that time and we saw that factor of two and with GPUs you see that same kind of factor of two. Sorry, when was that? <laughs> so so they, they have been, the single precision and double precision, there's always been a factor of two from, for many years in terms of it. And um, uh, we're just exploiting that factor today. So the question could, could arise is, let's say you wanted to go to less precision. So let's say we had the ability to do 16-bit arithmetic. Could we do that? So maybe doing an FPGA might be, a, might be an answer to that. FPGAs, you can dial up or dial down the precision associated with it, carry out the computation, getting much higher rates of execution at 16 bits than you do at the uh, 64 or 32 bit level and accomplish uh, this kind of accuracy. However, again, the condition number comes into play. So if the condition number of your problem is such that you're not gonna get any digits at 16 bits accuracy, then you got an issue. If you can get a digit, you can use it and exploit that feature to get the higher precisions. Yeah. So how could you? I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, you know, better condition the matrix, yeah. how could you, you know, incorporate preconditioning but still be able to exploit your, um, your, you know, multi-precision advantages? Right. So you can think about applying a set of transformations that could do that. You have to figure out what the what the right thing is. So you may want to. There there are ways to uh, approximate or to. Uh, uh, get an approximation to the condition number of the matrix and to use that as a scaling and then scale the matrix by something that helps uh, remove that ill conditioning associated with that. But I mean, you, could you like do something as simple as like just a Jacobi preconditioning and try to shrink your, you know, try to shrink oh, the oh, that way? Okay, now you're going into areas of sparse, uh, sparse iterative techniques. Yeah. Um, the sparse iterative techniques with this idea says you, you want to do an inner and outer iteration where the inner iteration is done in 32-bit arithmetic, and then the outer iteration is, is gonna drive the thing to a higher level of convergence. So you think about a 64-bit uh, kind of uh, issue at the, at the outer iteration of the matrix. So we've used that and exploited that in an implementation, which again shows close to a factor of two associated with the performance when you do that inner outer iteration 32 and 64-bit wise. Yep. Right, right. So it absolutely is a premium uh, on on the machines. Um, you know, the GPU has its memory, but we use the GPU not as a primary place to store the matrix. The GPU is used basically to as a as a literally a coprocessor that's there just to receive the data, do a piece of the uh, computation, and then send the data back, where that data then is not not referenced again. Another part of the matrix would be would be read into the into the GPU memory and, and carried out that way. So and the GPU typically has much less memory than, than the host processor as well. Uh, perhaps as a, a, f a factor of five or maybe even an order of magnitude less memory associated with it. Yeah. Um, so in this example, uh, I would say this is a well-conditioned problem. So I would say two or three iterations uh, the overall rate of execution, that is the operation count that was used, is the same for all of them. So we're not, um, uh, we're not uh, quote, cheating in, in, in that sense. We're not uh, giving somebody the advantage of a higher rate even though they did uh, different, different kinds of things. So I think these are interesting ideas that uh, perhaps have uh, some, uh, some application uh, not only in the dense world, but also in the sparse world, again, using this inner outer, inner outer kind of uh, iteration associated uh, with them. Um, you know, uh, eigenvalue problems are, uh, are, uh, have many applications and provide an important uh, vehicle for doing things in terms of uh, enhancing the performance. 
um, uh, we, we do a similar kind of thing in terms of trying to structure the uh, algorithm to do basically a matrix matrix operation whenever possible and to schedule those things in a very asynchronous uh, way on our machines. The typical implementation of an eigenvalue computation is going to be uh, affected by operations which look like uh, matrix vector operations. So there, there's a component which is going to be using matrix matrix and a component which is going to be doing matrix vector kind of operations. The performance unfortunately gets driven by the matrix vector kind of operations. It, 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 it reduces the performance uh, to a point where um, uh, it becomes very substandard associated with it. So this is looking at a reduction to a condensed form uh, for, in this case, it's, it's going for singular values by diagonal. It, it has uh, the DAG, in this case, says we, we do a reduction step, then we do a bunch of matrix vectors, and then we come back again and do a reduction step and a bunch of matrix vectors. This reduction step is uh, basically driven by matrix vector and, and uh, vector kind of operations, so the performance is very low, and we have this uh, fork join kind of parallelism going on, which is, again, going to inhibit the overall uh, execution flow. So um, what we want to do is to, um, is to re reduce that. Again, this is what uh, matrix vector and this is what matrix multiply looks like on these uh, machines, so we want to reduce that whenever possible. If you take a look at the overall time to solution for finding eigenvalues, the red part here, this is percent now, the red part is the reduction to the condensed form. That's in this case for tridiagonal, sorry, in this case for the symmetric problem, it's going to tridiagonal form. This is the percent of time for various size problems in reducing the matrix to tridiagonal. The green part is to compute the eigenvalues of the matrix. So that's the iterative part which takes the tridiagonal matrix and applies some uh, algorithm associated with it. In this case, we're doing the divide and conquer strategy on the symmetric matrix. So this gives us the eigenvalues, and then the blue part is to do the back transformations to get the eigenvectors of the original problem. So we're spending a tremendous amount of time here in the reduction step. 70% of the overall time is, is, is using that, is doing that reduction, and we want to reduce that. Of course, when we reduce that, these things pop up, but that's, that's to be expected, 100% uh, is 100% of the time. So the idea here is to uh, cast these uh, operations in terms of tile operations, to drive the algorithm in terms of doing matrix, matrix kind of operations whenever possible, extract parallelism, get overlap of operations, the same kind of techniques that we applied before. That says we have to engage in a two-step process. We have our square matrix, which we're going to reduce not to tridiagonal, but we reduce it to a banded form where we can reduce it to a banded form using uh, basically these uh, matrix matrix operations and do things very asynchronous. And then once we get to a banded form, we engage in another step of the process, which is uh, more tedious, which is very much like a communication reducing uh, algorithm, which focuses on uh, cache awareness in terms of structuring the algorithms to take advantage of the cache structure in the machine. So we, we basically chase uh, uh, bulges in this matrix out and reduce the matrix to, uh, to tridiagonal form. Uh, the overall structure of the algorithm says we're going to take our matrix and apply a sequence of transformations which introduce zeros in the lower part of this, of this panel here and do that in a tile fashion so we can have as much parallelism as possible associated with that. And uh, here's sort of a cartoon which I'm not going to be able to show. Uh, I'm not going to be able to show you at all. Okay, I won't show you the cartoon. There's been a few papers that have been written about that, but basically we take the matrix and we reduce it to a, a banded form, and then from the banded form, uh, reduce the next step. So it's important to go through that process. Uh, that gives us, again, this uh, directed acyclic graph associated with, uh, with the uh, overall algorithm, which is very rich in terms of matrix multiply operations, and using that, we can effectively uh, effectively then go to the next step of the operation which takes that banded form and reduces it to the uh, tridiagonal matrix. And that's a more tedious part of the algorithm where we engage in a bulge chasing uh, effect. We're going to introduce zeros uh, into, a, into a certain part of that uh, band and that's going to cause some other elements to become non-zero. And then we, uh, we basically go into a process of chasing 
uh, that bulge around the matrix until it effectively uh, leaves the matrix, and that would be called a sweep associated with it. And the result of that sweep introduces some additional zeros in the super and subdiagonal of that matrix. And we go through that same process again. We're working with tiles. Again, things are going to be very cache friendly or cache aware, keeping information in cache as long as possible to get reuse, minimizing communication through the memory hierarchy of the overall system. When you, when you look at the performance, uh, we end up with a situation uh, that, looks, um, that looks something like this. This is a speed up. Uh, associated with the uh, overall thing, and we're looking at a speed up um, compared to MKL. MKL is the math kernel library uh, associated with this. If we're looking for, um, if we're looking for the, um, uh, uh, so this is, uh, the, the red line is the, eigen, is the singular value decomposition. The blue line is looking for the eigenvalues of the matrix. If you just want the eigenvalues of the matrix, no vectors associated with it, what this is telling us on this particular platform, which is a, which is a two socket, eight core Sandy Bridge uh, processor, comparing against MKL, uh, we're about uh, four point, uh, f roughly five times faster for large enough size problems than the traditional approach, which is the traditional way of computing the eigenvalues, basically doing the LA pack style uh, reduction to tridiagonal form and then executing it. So we're five times faster and we go through this two-step process of computing the uh, banded form and then doing the iter iterative process on the banded form to reduce it by that bulge chasing uh, process. We end up with an algorithm which is much more effective. If we want 20% of the eigenvalues, then that reduces the overall speed up to around two and a half times what we see from Intel. And if we want all the vectors, we're something on the order of one and a half times. And that's because we have to accumulate all the transformations associated with that bulge chasing. So there's a tremendous amount of work that's there and that all has to be accumulated. And that's additional work that the MKL algorithm or the traditional algorithm didn't, uh, didn't have to engage in. Um, uh, this is uh, looking at that same kind of information. Uh, I just want to point out here, um, uh, it's important to get the, um, the block size or the tile size associated with uh, the algorithm to the right point. So we're looking at three different phases of the algorithm, the reduction to uh, tridiagonal, uh, the, the dense to banded, and then the banded to, tridiag to, to tridiagonal form. And we're looking at different tile sizes, and we're looking at um, uh, the time spent. So we want to minimize time in this particular case. If you get the tile size wrong, you, know, you can be spending much, much more time and if you got the right tile size, if you optimize for the tile size. So getting the tile size right is an important aspect. Again, there's knobs that have to be turned by somebody. We want to internalize this in the software and have the software drive the optimization as much as possible. So the software should um, do something to calculate what the optimal block size is for a particular algorithm on your machine, do that once, capture that information, then use that block size from that point, that point going forward. So that's, uh, that's the goal of that, of that process. And when you do things correctly, um, you end up with, um, this is the reduction time uh, associated with uh, going to that, uh, to, to that banded form. Uh, this is the time associated with uh, some of the bulge chasing and then um, uh, doing, the, uh, doing the other thing. So we've, we've accomplished what we set out to do. Again, we have 100%, that's always gonna be there. We've reduced the, uh, the time to go to that convent condensed form by quite a bit from what it was in the previous, uh, the previous uh, slides. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop at this point. Um, we've reached the end. Uh, you're, you're exhausted, I'm sure, with two weeks of hearing uh, people ramble and uh, uh, my voice is getting a little bit uh, 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 sore. Um, uh, there's, there's a few more slides which talk about what to do in the distributed case. It follows in a very similar form uh, to what was done in the shared memory case. We have a set of software tools which makes going to distributed memory uh, much easier. Uh, it's not a hands, uh, hands reworking, it's, a, it's an automated process uh, which, take, uh, the, um, which take our uh, DEG expressions and moving them into distributed world, uh, doing it in a way which has a, um, a distributed scheduler. So the interesting part here is, is the, we don't have a centralized scheduler. The scheduler has been distributed to all of the, all of the uh, nodes in, in the machine 
and those nodes, because it has knowledge about the DAG, knows how to do the message passing associated uh, with it. So that's a, that's a very interesting and uh, perhaps needs another, another day or another talk to, to, to fill out the gaps there. So I want to just thank you for the, your attention. Um, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, although my time is very short. Um, let me just point out that um, uh, Paul maybe have me had mentioned this. Uh, probably 30 years ago, we had similar kinds of, of, of uh, uh, summer courses like this, and they were very beneficial, not only to the people who attended them, uh, but also the people who gave the talks uh, associated with it. So thanks for your endurance here in going through this, and I hope it was a, a pleasurable experience uh, for, for all of you. Thank you, Jack.